Hey, welcome everybody to the Blue Line Mid-Season Podcast. I'm Alf DeBlasis. That's uh, Mark Farah, Toronto Maple Leaf guy on the other side of the screen. And uh, we're going to look back at the Leafs' first half of the season. Uh, the team's number two in the Atlantic Division, top three in the NHL. Hey, Mark, are we ready to do this? Hey, wasn't it just a little over a month and a half ago when everybody wanted everybody fired and trade? Let's do this. All right, so let's break the team down through the first half of the season. Let's start with goaltending, Mark. Both Samsonov and Murray are ranked in the top 25 in the NHL on uh, moneypuck.com. They've got a lot of interesting stats in terms of goal, goaltenders and how they rank and how they rate amongst, uh, amongst their peers. And both have better than expected goals against averages. Now, they've both been through some slumps, but recently they both uh, really picked up their game. Mark. Who do you start number one, game one, in the playoffs? I'm going Matt Murray. I'm going Matt Murray only because of the fact that we can compare him to when he was playing in his prime. Even though he's not in his prime now, he could be compared to when he played in Pittsburgh. And he was playing with some great offense there, but not necessarily the defensive forward or defensive forwards and defensive defensemen that he's it's very similar to what the Maple Leafs have now. And I mean, we can compare that, uh, you know, look at what they had on their blue line when he won those two Stanley Cups and he basically carried the defense on his own. And uh, now you can compare that very similar here. And I, and I see some hunger. Both these guys are playing for contracts. And as we mentioned earlier in the year, uh, the Leafs seem to find those little golden uh, nuggets in the rough and, and they seem to know when to let him go and seem to know when to keep him. And we've got two of them right now. They haven't been that great, but they've been good enough for us to be one of the top placed teams in the National Hockey League. Alf. No, for sure. And I feel a lot better having one that is just as good and just as reliable a goaltender as the other. And it's a, it's a far cry from Jack Campbell last year. And then who knows what as his backup, right? So I'd really... I, I, I'm really much more confident going into the second half of the season and the playoff stretch, having both of these guys playing reasonably well and uh, giving the, 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 the team uh, minutes as well as being able to rotate in and out, especially as we saw over the past uh, weekend when they both took uh, one of the, uh, the two games across the weekend and both came up really sharp. And, and keep in mind too, right, is that the, the thing is they get along real well. So it's a healthy competition that we're yeah. seeing in two guys that want to succeed together. And there's no guy, they're pushing each other the right way. And remember the old saying that we've heard a hundred times, find me a good defenseman, I'll find you a good goaltender, find me a good goaltender, and I'll find you a great coach. And it, it, this is all kind of going hand in hand right now, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, all right, let's move on to uh, the defense. Um, it's been Despite all the injuries that uh, at least have, uh, have had on the blue line over the course of uh, the first two or three months of the season, it's been actually pretty steady and pretty dependable. And as much as Riley and Brody have been the, the top pair, I think Giordano was the glue that kind of held the team together through all of those injuries. Do you agree or disagree? Listen, I agree. Anytime you can get the mileage out of a guy who's played that much and wants to play at home and is excited to be here. And remember back in the day, guys like Conn Smythe would believe the old players should get the most ice time. And they would back in those early days of the forties, fifties, and even going into the sixties. And so a lot of people believe that the young guys should be the ones eating the minutes and logging the minutes, but some can see thoroughly that that's not necessarily the case. However, credit needs to be given to the coach because without a system that's coming into place, there's no way that they'd be able to sustain, sustain these injuries and be able to play the system that they are. And just look at the total commitment to defense. When you look at the forwards and a guy that I'm going to go on about like thoroughly is, is Holmberg, Pontus Holmberg. That guy's come in and we're going to talk about him when he gets yeah. to the forwards. But you look at the depth in their forwards that they have and the commitment and looking at a guy like Matthews and Marner and those big four guys coming back and their numbers aren't lying. I mean, their commitment to making sure that they're playing very sound defensive. They're willing to play you in a, in a two, one game or an eight, seven game. They're very confident in both ways, but that defense core with the interchanging pieces that they've seen throughout the season has proven a typical going back to the Boston Bruins, who I don't think are as big of a threat as the standing show right now. Let me, let me let you know that as well is that, you know, they have interchangeable pieces that continue to come in and come out. 
And we saw that last night, uh, you know, with Timmons coming into the lineup and everybody says, well, who's this guy? He's stepped in and eaten up some very, very valuable minutes. He's making some really tough decisions for his coaching staff. So again, I love the fact that they've been able to interchange these guys yeah. while they're gone. I mean, God bless Muzzin. We hope that he can, can live a healthy life. Uh, rumor has it that he won't be returning. But, you know, that's some punch power that we really miss in our lineup. But you don't necessarily need to see big body open ice body checks to play sound defense. And in fact, the game has really gotten away from those big ice, uh, you know, open ice hits. However, they can certainly, you know, rile up a crowd. And in Toronto, we need that all the time. Yeah, it's really more a case of neutralizing players with good stick work, angling, positioning. And look, I'm I'm really uh, uh, enthused by the fact that it's not just, you know, the guys on the blue line. It's the entire team that is committed and willing to play a more defensive approach and really shut the opposition down. Now, okay, Mark, let's move on to the forwards, and we'll talk about the uh, whole group uh, a little bit later on, but I want to talk about the core four for the time being. Nylander's leading the team in scoring. Uh, Matthews has hit 20 goals uh, again. John Tavares has been scoring extremely well of late, uh, but Mitch Marner is on pace for another 90-goal season or, or sorry, 30 goal season, 90 point season, uh, possibly pushing uh, 100 points. He's uh, he, he's effective five on five. He's on the power play. He's on the, the penalty kill. For me, Mitch Marner overall has been the team MVP so far. What do you think? Listen, buddy, I'm not the guy who sits in my basement with the, my dolls on the wall yelling and screaming at everybody. I'm going to tell you the way I see it here, okay? And I'm going to be completely honest. I don't dislike Mitch Marner. I don't. And I think he brings a lot of value to this team. But when I look at what Marner, Matthews, Tavares, the whole big four core have brought is a total commitment to a complete game. And when you watch Tavares this year, he's playing with a confidence that we haven't seen almost since he's come to Toronto. I mean, I saw a little dangle spin around, almost a Denny Savardian spin around in that game yesterday that we haven't seen from Tavares. He's always been a good guy, uh, a very good in close, you know, 10 foot in type guy, deflecting, taking up the dirty pucks and, and making something happen of it. But now we're seeing something where he's got a little bit, he seems a little bit lighter in his legs. He's lost some weight. And I think the, the, the training, the change of training and the opportunity to play with Mitch has probably obviously helped him because he did score a career high with Mitch in his first season. Now, but I'm also looking at Willie Nylander, who showed up to camp and just looking at a picture of him, his face looks fuller, he looks thicker. And I think he's really been underestimated in the, in the ability to drive through contact. I mean, he's never going to be your type of guy that's going to initiate contact. But that doesn't necessarily mean that he's not effective on the defensive side of the puck. He does often see himself in between that, that play where he does find himself on the right side taking away lanes, taking away, you know, offensive chances. And if you look at his numbers, his giveaways were, were by far the lowest of the four. And his plus minus, which some people say don't count, now they do count. I mean, when you're on the yeah. ice for more goals than you give up, I look at Matthews and Marner and Bunting, let's not, let's not fail sure. to Bunting, are way ahead of a bunch of the group where Marner was a plus, uh, was an even, where the other two guys were, I think were a plus 19, plus 17 last time I saw him with Bunting being ahead of it. Now, Bunting to me, and I'm going to be completely honest with you on this, on most top lines, isn't a top line player, okay? And and when you're limiting two guys that you that are generally going to score, I mean, the chances that I've seen Bunting miss on this year, and, and that guy could have 40 in the net already playing with those two. So, I would love to see them get someone to con really compliment them and bring Bunting down to that real agitating the third third line guy that can put the odd one in. Uh, but getting back to Marner, listen, um, I, I'm going to be honest with you, okay, and I'm going to be very transparent, okay. Is is I just don't believe. I think the 23 goal uh, game point streak was great, but it took 23 points in in consecutive games just to stay tied with Mar Matthews and Marner. OK, uh, with Matthews and Nylander. Sorry, let me stand corrected on that. And so when I look at what those two guys are bringing and let's be honest, Matthews is on everybody's zone. Every team, every team that's coming into Toronto or playing against Toronto, he's their number one guy that they're focusing on. So he's got two guys on him almost every time you turn around. He's got very little room to move and he's still producing at a very respectful rate. And if you watch his defensive game is as good as anybody and just about as good as anybody in the national hockey league, his ability to take pucks away, his ability to take away lanes, to battle for space. 
he, you know, for a while there, he was amongst the leaders. I think he's top five on the team in body contact, body checking. I mean, he's not afraid and he's got that little edge to him as well. So I'm going to give the MVP of this season to the top four of the Toronto Maple Leafs, those big four core, because I think they've all showed up and they've all been a difference maker and they're all in some way kind of justifying their, their salaries. It's the politically correct answer, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it's, 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 it's absolutely the, the right answer because all four of them have contributed in their own way. And if you, it's really difficult to, to choose between one or the other. Um, listen, you mentioned uh, Pontius Holmberg a little while ago. And I want to get on to some of the other uh, uh, forwards uh, in particular uh, first year players, on the Leafs or, or players who have uh, who just arrived uh, this season, and for me, Holmberg has been probably a, the steadiest kind of two-way center. He's not flashy. He puts the work in. Uh, he's got two game-winning goals. He actually leads the team in shooting percentage. Um, I wanted to get your opinion on him since you did bring him up earlier, but also some of the other players that have been, are new to the Leafs this year and Yarncroc. Uh, Aston Reese and even uh, Timmons on the back end. Well, Yarn has been unbelievable to be able to dance up and down your lineup. I mean, just about everywhere they've put him in, he's been effective. Watching him, watching, you're right, all, all the guys that you just mentioned, but let's not forget a guy who's still been around in Kerfoot too. There's a little firecracker that's on the ice and watching him initiate contact being half the size of a lot of these players and the go, go, go on them. You know, it's trickled down the lineup and these guys have, have played a very responsible game. And, you know, any one of the four that you're talking about, I like Holmberg in particular because I just feel that he plays such a quiet game. And we often, you know, it's it's like talking about referees, right? When you don't notice right. a referee, it means they've generally done a pretty good job. Sure. When those guys are matching up against other teams' top lines in a position to shut down, and they're they're not being mentioned. It's generally a great thing. And and you know, I know that Coach Keefe had a lot of really good things to say about him earlier on, where he was mentioning that he's I think the first player that he's ever coached that he didn't even need to go through a video chat with at the end of the game because he just felt his game was so nicely sound. And that's been something that's come up with him. And you know, we talk about the Leafs' lack of drafting and lack of draft picks. Look at the Leafs drafts and look at all of the number one picks that have made their lineup. And I believe there's only two in the last couple of years um, that, that haven't made their lineup because we've even got a couple that are prepared to step up here. And, you, you know, you look at the number one picks that they've had, they've all made their team. I'm not sure there's many teams in the National Hockey League right now that can say that they have that much homegrown talent that has come up through their system and just complement them with the right pieces. And so, you know, again, we're talking about, uh, you know, why isn't, why don't we hear from Shanahan? Where's our coach? Where's, where's our coach? Where's our general manager? I mean, we've barely seen Shanahan and he's quietly let people do their job. And this team has quietly gone on and everybody says, well, it's a first round. It's a first round. It's a shame that these teams are matching up in the first round and it's not fair. And it's really not fair in the fact that, home team crowds only get to see so if, if Toronto matches up with Tampa Bay this year one of those teams one of those groups is only going to have a chance to have maximum of four home dates when they've worked all season to battle and try and get in the best position that's why they've got to get rid of this matchup it's got to go back to one and yeah. eight and seven never mind the interdivision rivalries here those teams have earned that right to have that home revenue, to have that home crowd cheering them on and giving their, themselves the, the chance that they've earned and battled through all season long. You want to make it more competitive? Keep doing the things that we should be seeing, and that's going one to eight, two to seven. Have the seating done properly. But, you know, those guys that we've talked about, I'm rambling on here, I'm wandering off on you, but um, the team's defense has been so sound overall. You just don't see a lot of glaring mistakes. You, you very rarely see glaring mistakes on this team. Um, unfortunately, some of the times that, that, that you do see it, they pay the price for it. But, you know, there's a reason why they've got the numbers that they do. There's the reason why even earlier on the season, they had a great record and they really weren't scoring any goals. And that's because they've taken care of the Wrens so much. Let's talk about 34. Does he, does he look like he's interested in winning individual awards or does he look like he's looking to win a major, a major Stanley no, Cup here? And, and yeah, absolutely. That's the difference. That's what we're seeing right now. And uh, he's invested, he's invested in the team and he is working his butt off to get back, back check and bring the puck back up ice. All right, Mark, let's uh, keep talking about uh, the uh, Maple Leafs and let's get to something that you've been mentioning 
on several occasions, and that is Sheldon Keith. Um, he's managed to keep the team winning despite those injuries on defense that we talked about. Um, he's tinkered with his power play and he's used five forwards uh, in the power play, especially when uh, Riley was out injured. And that seemed to be effective for a period of time. And he's uh, he's rotating his goalies effectively so that both, you know, seem to be coming up with their best game in every situation. For me, I think he's a, he's a contender for coach of the year this year. What do you think? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, he, whether or not he gets that consideration because he's expected to be there based on the talent he has, I think people often forget how tough it can be to manage those many, those many big, I won't, I don't want to say Eagles, but big, you know, big, uh, big presence in the room, I guess would be the right way to say it. And again, here's a guy that just not too long ago, everybody wanted fired, said the players had turned him out. Uh, everybody tuned him out and that both him and, and Duba should be gone. I mean, congratulations to these guys. They've tinkered the right way. They've messed around the right way, right way. And they haven't let any of this uh, media bother anybody. And I do want to make one thing clear because I didn't want to mention the media today before we go back, because the coaches are the ones that usually have to face everybody is that people talk about Toronto, you know, this city being bigger and stronger and everybody being harder on the team. Uh, listen, I've been to the playoffs when they played Washington. I've been to the playoffs twice when they played Boston. I've been there when they were there last year in Tampa. I tune in to their local sports radio stations. And I'm going to tell you, I talked to their fans there. Those teams are all as hard on their teams as they are with us. They may not have the population, may not have the overall hockey interest when you've got, you know, Tom Brady playing in your town or you've got other big, big sports teams. But I can tell you, they are very hard on their teams as well. And every single one of those opposing teams think the world of us and we're just about to get there and we are going to get there at some point. But, you know, watching uh, one of the key things that we've watched, which will be irrelevant, I guess, when the playoff comes is how our coaches have adjusted to many different factors, but look at the overtime three on three, we couldn't win anything. And here they are tinkering, trying, practicing and admitting to not practicing it often because they just don't see it enough. And, and being very honest and sincere. And one thing is, as a guy that I coach for a lot of years here too, and one thing that I always like to do is be sincere to your players. Be honest. When you make a mistake, own it and work on it together as a group. You know, try and come up with the best resolution. And one thing that I think that Keith brings that a lot of other coaches, you know, when you watch Tortorella and his temper tantrums and, and his attitude and stuff like that, you know, Keith kind of reminds of when I, what I like to coach and the approach I'd like to take is because it was almost like a big brother effect on the team. Okay, guys, listen, let's work on things. You know, he doesn't pretend to be bigger and better than everybody else. He doesn't pretend to have a bigger attitude or ego than everybody on his team. He's a pretty sincere guy and he tells you exactly what he's thinking. He's very open and honest and he, and he backs his players. And I think his players really appreciate that. I definitely think he should be considered coach of the year. Although again, here in Toronto, when he is expected with this group and they're still looking at it as a failure because they haven't gotten out of that first round. Yeah, no, for sure. That's uh that's a fair point. And uh, probably, you know, until, uh, they do make that step into the into the second round and won't uh, be given as much consideration. But really, when we talk about awards such as this, uh, they're based on the regular season. They're not based on the playoffs, right? So really, if he takes them to uh, where we expect them to be, and that is somewhere between right the first or second place in the Atlantic Division and in the top five in the NHL, I think he's got to be given consideration, no doubt about that. Listen, our, our producer James has thrown in a couple of other questions, a couple of fun ones that I want to get your reaction to as well, uh, Mark, and want to talk about what was the best game that you've seen the Leafs play so far this year? I know you've been to a lot of games uh, at the Scotiabank Center. Uh, one game that stuck out for me wasn't too long ago, was on New Year's Eve when the Leafs played Colorado. They won 6-2, and I think that game summed up really how this team can play top to bottom. Uh, a, a, a kind of close second was their 4-1 win over Tampa Bay um, in Toronto just uh, just uh, about 10 days earlier than that. But I want to get your thoughts on uh, what's been their best, most rounded game so far this season. Absolutely. I mean, there's lots of perfect examples, but you know, like, that game against Colorado was as as top, you know, top to bottom, start to finish as complete a game as you're going to see. One thing I really like about watching this team and, and trying to narrow it down to one game is let's look at the fact that the last two games, I mean, they came out in the first period, they stunk the joint out against Detroit, but they figured it out, and put it together. And that's something that we've really failed to see with this team over a long period of time. You know, people are often criticizing the Leafs for always like playing down to their opponent. 
every NHL team does it. We just see yeah. it more here in Toronto because we follow our team religiously, you know, and the fact that we're not seeing that as often as we used to is another key sign that they're just playing a defensive defensively sound game where they're not giving away big opportunities. They have, you know, some, they have some lulls, but what team doesn't we're forgetting these are young men. They're human. Like how many of us go to work every day and have a perfect day every day? It just doesn't happen. So, you know, that game against Colorado was an absolute sta like staple in the season in showing them that you could compete. Now, they had some injuries at that time as well, but, you know, they're still a, they're a Stanley Cup champion and they're not going away anywhere anytime soon. So that's the team really for me that I think is going to be still that team to, uh, to, to compare yourselves to beat. But it certainly does send a message when you can play with a group like that and compete with them for a well, full 60 minutes. Absolutely. And we're talking about the last two Stanley Cup champions in Colorado and Tampa Bay, and they handled them both in those in those uh, two games. So I think plenty of promise in terms of their most recent performances, and in particular in those two games. I want to look at uh, something in, on the opposite side in terms of weaknesses, and I, I think you mentioned earlier something about you know Michael Bunting not really being a first line player. Uh, my my concern is a, a little further down the lineup in terms of depth, and uh, I like. Holmberg is a fourth line center. I'm not sure I like the pieces around him. Uh, they've tried Anderson and Aston Reese and uh, Dryden Hunt lately has come in. Wayne Simmons made another appearance. Uh, I'm not sure they're quite there because none of those guys has really stepped up and provided, you know, the punch that you kind of need from that fourth line. And I wonder if uh, they probably need to go into the market uh, just before the trade deadline and add another depth piece specifically for that fourth line. I'd like to get your opinion on that. Absolutely. I mean, every team would love to add a depth piece to any lineup at any point of the year. And if you look at 32 lineups and you know that 16 of them are going to the playoffs, I can guarantee all 16 would love to add another defense, would love to add some depth on their forwards and go, you know, take it from there. But it just doesn't happen that way. Trades today are the hardest they've ever been able to be made. Right. I mean, a lot of, adding a, an O'Reilly from St. Louis, potentially with one of those big defensemen, what are you going to have to give up? I mean, I love the sounds of this nice kid coming up and the fact that he brings a little bit of the physical game. He's got a presence and there's a guy that's not only going to add to your depth, he's going to add to your top six and potentially right away. So, you know, it's easy to sit back and say what we're looking for. One thing that really, really turned me on in last night's game was watching that uh, Lilligren point shot that went off the crossbar. And one thing that I've always said is that is something that I feel this team really, really lacks is that big bomb from the point on the power play. Nobody's, nobody's intimidated by Marner's shot. Nobody's intimidated by, by Riley's shot. Their, their attempt is just to try and get it on that. So bodies are going to lay all over the place for it. But remember Ally Afridi with that boom and hundred mile an hour slap shot from the point. How many guys looking for contracts and looking for, you know, opportunities in the future are going to be laying out in front of one of those? Uh, not many. So, I mean, you know, I, I would love to see them add a big bulky defenseman with some, with some, uh, some, some shot power on the back end that can really start to push that puck to the net and get clear some way uh, by guys just not wanting to get in front of it. Um, St. Louis, you know, I feel like there's a great trade opportunity there, but you're going to have to give up something. That team hasn't gotten to where it is by, by just giving players away. So, I mean, I think a guy like Ryan O'Reilly would be great. I still like uh, an Austin Watson. I've really liked this kid. I watched him right back from junior. I think he brings enough salt and vinegar or salt and pepper, I guess we'll call yeah. it. Lineup. Grit. I think, yeah, yeah. That, that I think would be something that could really, uh, you know, provide a presence out there without even necessarily having to play on that line. But Again, I just think that they need to add someone to complement those top three. I, I find that you've got two great shooters in, in, in Nylander and Matthews. You've got a great in-close guy in Tavares. And then you've got two guys that really no one is going to be afraid of. And we saw that against Montreal a couple of years ago where they had Weber and Deneau watching Matthews and said, we're going to take our chances on letting Marner have a clear path to the net versus Carey Price. And, and we all know who won that battle. So, I mean, you, you need to have consistent firepower and you yeah. need to have lots of options. And when you look at a team like Colorado, you look at a lot of these heavyweight teams, they've got four or five solid options on there and, yeah. and they, they don't change. Right. So 
Yeah, we'll have uh, we'll have plenty of time to talk about the uh, the trade deadline and just you know moving moving pieces and who might be able to fit into the Leafs lineup. But I'd like to look ahead. And I know we're only mid season, but I do want to kind of look ahead. And because you brought up Boston in terms of uh, you know not being as good perhaps as they are in terms of what where they are in the standings, and uh, we're talking about the Leafs being in this company with the Bruins, the Canes, the Devils, Vegas. Uh, all in the top five right now in the league. So based on what we've seen so far, are the Leafs good enough to beat the Boston Bruins or any of those other teams in the playoffs right now? I still think Tampa has a serious threat to them. I think that they've got that depth and I think that they play with their lineup enough to make sure that their guys are going to be fresh going into the playoffs. I mean, we've seen Hedman bounce off that number one power play. We've seen Vasilevsky taking some time here and, and they know what it takes to win and, and they know how to play the games, how to get you riled up on the ice, how to get teams off their game. That's the team that to me is going to be the biggest competition. I'm not suggesting that Boston is a weak team or a horrible team, but you know, going into Boston years ago, you'd really feel that kind of sense of uh, uncomfort, uh, uncomfortability when you go in there and feel like, okay, it's only a matter of time till we start coughing something up or we that every time we would get a lead, you could sense that um, that real the nervous system kicking in at a certain point. I'm not really feeling it with that team this year. I mean, like I said, they've had a good record. But I, I, I feel very comfortable, the blue and white, if they go in and play their game and don't, you know, don't succumb to other people's uh, idiosyncrasies or other uh, opportunities they're trying to get you to play down to. I mean, uh, you know, I, I don't necessarily want to see someone licking Marshan's face, but I certainly wouldn't mind seeing him get dumped <laughs> off of his feet once or twice. Yeah. And it could be done by a smaller guy like Austin Reese or some guys that could just get him right off his game. So, you know, I'd love the chance to, to, to take them both down this year. I think how cool would that be if we could get into that first round and, and really get over the hump and, and this team's preparing themselves, buddy. They're really going well, for it. I, I agree. I think they could take Tampa and, uh, and I think they, they can match up with Boston and take and, and take the Bruins as well. And really any one of those other teams. I mean, I think, uh, you know, we've had success against every one of those teams already this season. So there's no reason to believe that the, they can't listen. I want to close with one thing, uh, Mark, and it's this. Matthews, McDavid. Matthews has emerged as a more effective two-way player this season. We talked about that. We've, we've seen it. It's, it's evident. Uh, but Connor, for me, is the purest offensive talent in the NHL right now. The two of them are separated by almost 30 points. It's almost unbelievable to, to see that, but it's true. But would you agree that Connor McDavid is right now the purest offensive talent in the league? Oh, hundred percent. I mean, if we're talking one side of the game, you have to look at Connor McDavid, but if I'm taking a player to win a Stanley cup with that can control, I mean, I remember watching Nazem Kadri shut McDavid and throw him off his game. And I believe there was a big reason why the Calgary flames went out and made that acquisition. And it wasn't to put, put, uh, put the bury the biscuit. I mean, as, as good as he's done offensively, his job will be judged if they match up against the Edmonton Oilers. And I think that the fact is, is that, you know, Matthews just brings both sides of the game where he can he can elevate with his strength. And you've seen he's got a little bit of a mean streak in him where I feel that, uh, you know, Connor, again, has had the chance to, you know, keep in mind, Matthews is still leading the National Hockey League and even strength points. OK, yeah. that's that a lot because Matthews doesn't have an MVP in, in Leon Dreisaitl to to match up with on a power play on a regular basis. So, I mean, I'm looking at what you've got there and. And listen, uh, you can't knock Connor McDavid, but the other thing too is longevity. At some point, Connor speed's going to slow down a little bit. And I, where I still feel like a guy like Matthews, his, his big body presence, his strength, will be able to carry him into a long, a much deeper career overall. All right, Mark, final point. And I'm going to make a prediction. We just watched the world junior championships. We saw a generational talent. You know what I'm talking about? Connor Bedard. I think Connor Bedard is going to be better than Matthews and McDavid in five years. What do you think? Slow it down there. You're starting to sound like some of the reporters <laughs> that want to hear themselves more than the actual player. Listen, Connor Bedard's a heck of a hockey player. I remember a heck of a goaltender in Justin Pogge who was going to come out of the juniors and become our next star goaltender, whatever happened there. Listen, it's a big step to go from the world juniors to the National Hockey League. And, you know, as, as proud as I was as a Canadian, and we tuned into everything, and I was amazed by what some of the some of the plays this kid was making and the shots he has and stuff like that. It's going to be a big transition going into the National Hockey League. Do I think he's going to be a bust? Absolutely not. 
But there was a lot of people who thought Yakupov was going to be a hell of a hockey player. And I had a lot of arguments with people back then on why he shouldn't have been the first overall pick. Uh, this kid's going to be hands down the first overall pick. He's not going to be a bust like Alexander Degg uh, by any means, but I think he's got a lot of proven to be doing before he's even compared to those guys. And I think if he has a great career and can even be mentioned in those conversations, I think that the, whatever team, potentially the Chicago Blackhawks is going to be one very, very, very lucky. <laughs> no kidding. Hey, Mark, thanks a lot for doing this. And listen, for more content from the Blue Line, link, like, subscribe, and for uh, additional content, we'll be uh, uh, cranking out more videos uh, like this in, uh, in future. Mark, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Talk to you soon. Love you guys. Go Leafs, go. Let's take the house down in the spring.